Well, whew. we made it through that part, didn't we? Um, it is it is so good to be here, and um, and I appreciate y'all's flexibility. One of the uh, parables, or one of the beatitudes that Jesus um, never got around to saying, but but I'm sure he said it somewhere. Uh, he, 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 he would have said, uh, blessed are the flexible, uh, for they shall not be bent out of shape, you know that? <laughs> and, uh, and that really is kind of the way we're going to roll here the first uh, month or two especially, because um, there's a lot that I don't know, and there's a, uh, a lot that you all do know, and uh, you all just have to be patient with me as you um, point me in the right direction, and one day we're going to get, uh, get things um, uh, all on the same page, but uh, it really is uh, a blessing for me and my family to be here and to uh, uh, enjoy the sweet spirit of this place. So, Jesus is um, doing what Jesus did, going from place to place. And he leaves the place and comes to his hometown in chapter 6 of Mark. And we're told his disciples follow him, right there back to his hometown. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. Now, I've seen some of those looks, they they, they happened this morning when I walked in the door. Uh, you, you want us to say, what? Uh, and, and so I get this, and they said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown among their own kin, who won't come up for children's time, <laughs> and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And Jesus was amazed. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there till you leave the place. And if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Jesus, since he told the parable that I mentioned earlier about the seeds and soils in Mark 4, He's been on a roll. He has gone around the countryside and he is getting stuff done. Liberating people from demons. Healing a woman from bleeding. Raising a little girl from what everybody thought was certain death. It seems that every seed he is slinging is sprouting. Good soil seems to, to abound and, and the growth is amazing. And, and crowds are growing, the excitement is growing. Momentum is in his favor. And he uh, comes to his hometown, synagogue, on a roll. And to hear Mark tell it, Jesus starts hurling seed all over the pews that he grew up climbing over. Now, y'all know that this is a familiar place to Jesus. He knows its stories, he knows its customs, he knows its quirks. He knows how easy worship works. He, he knows how the slides go. And, and he, he even knows where um, <coughs> the, the old lady, Miss Baker, she, she keeps her knitting needles. If the, if the rabbi is going on particularly long, she'll get out the knitting needles. Never mind the Sabbath. She's got stuff to do. And if he doesn't have anything important to say, she's at least going to get something done. He knows where she keeps those. He knows the place where... Where old man Stewart, that time uh, everybody remembers, was was coming up to take up the offering and, and tripped and, and fell and the pew left a mark on him and he left a mark on the pew and, 
And Jesus could point that out and laugh with his friends about that. He knows all their stories and, and they know all his. And knowing that, knowing them as he does and knowing him as they do, they seem to be expecting something different than what Jesus is slinging. They're excited to start with, of course, well, until he starts preaching. Um, they're excited he's there, and all the people with him, the place is packed. But they lose interest pretty quick because Jesus comes in using preacher words that they aren't familiar with, and they want to know why he doesn't mention the, the, the sink in the fellowship hall that's still leaking after all this time. Shouldn't that have made the list? Uh, they want to know why he doesn't comment on the flower beds that just don't look the same since Joshua became the chair of trustees. And, and, and he doesn't mention Sunday school or apportionments or a race for the rabbi. That's a big one. Uh, he should have mentioned that. He doesn't say a word about it. And so even though Mark never tells us specifically what he does say, we know that it doesn't match up with what the crowd is expecting. And suddenly we all get to see what Jesus was talking about when he mentioned the seeds and the soils. Because the soil in Jesus' hometown is not receptive to the seeds of Jesus' teaching. And so the people start asking a, a, a series of rapid-fire questions. And the first, college, the first question is about the college he attended. Now I'm a little sensitive to this because I, I, I was one of those guys, like uh, some others around here, who, who didn't go off to school, but I stayed in my hometown to go to school. But in Jesus' case, they aren't talking about the college he attended. They're talking about the college he never attended. And they say, where did a boy who grew up in our schools in Nazareth get this kind of learning? He must have made a deal with somebody. He must have started some kind of online program. Because we have never heard talk like this around here. So who is Jesus serving exactly? And if, and if he's the puppet, who's pulling the strings? They ask a question about where this is coming from. And the second question they ask is about the wisdom that he's offering. And, and it doesn't sound like what Mary would have taught him or should have taught him. It doesn't sound practical or reasonable or, or consistent with anything that they believe in Nazareth. If that's what he calls wisdom, some of these people would just assume he'd go back to Miss Mangold's Sabbath school class. He's got a lot to learn from that lady. And, uh, and finally, they start asking questions about the stuff he's doing. What, what's going on with this guy? Like, little kids are determined, they're, they're, they're like little children who are determined to find out how their uh, older cousins are doing a card trick. You ever, you know that, that dynamic where the kids are, are, uh, are sure that if they dig in, they can... They can be the one who figures it out and, and, and unmasks the magician's magic. And so they're, they're, they're conspiring. They're trying to figure out, what is he really doing? How is he really healing these people? This is a picture Mark is drawing us in a story of what unreceptive story looks like. It looks like your own people turning on you. Your message being rejected, your miracles going unreceived. And Jesus looks upon so many of his loved ones with their arms crossed, their brows furrowed. And Jesus is amazed. He's amazed at their unbelief. He's amazed that the very people who are eager to serve God are so good at getting in God's way. He's amazed that people who long to live meaningful lives are willing or unwilling to consider the teaching that Jesus has been given. He is amazed that the very place that paved the way for him as a child is now so full of stumbling blocks. And that word is used in the Greek, scandals of his teaching. 
hear Mark tell that Jesus looks at us and is amazed. And this is a clue for us that, that this story is not just a story about Jesus' effects on other people, especially those closest to him, but it's a story of the effects those closest to Jesus have on him. He is affected by rejection. He is amazed at what he is up against. He, he, is, he is turned to wonder. It's the same phrase in, in Greek here that, um, that the shepherds feel when they see the angels in the field um, bearing the news of the, the birth of, of Jesus. Jesus wonders like Peter does when he walks away days from an empty tomb. The same word in Greek occurs. He is amazed. Who knew? We could have that effect on Jesus. Amazing him to death. But that's exactly what Mark says happens. Jesus looks on the withered stalks of what ought to be a beautiful garden of growth. And the sight of it stops him in his tracks. And the one who in the beginning knelt down and, and breathed into us the breath of life has his own breath taken away by our, by our unbelief. And our ability to change the subject, and our ability to avoid the parts of his teaching that don't suit us, and our ability to hijack his agenda in favor of ours, What do y'all think of that? This moment in time when Jesus, like that picture of him on the screen. What does it take in your life and mine to, to get Jesus back on his heels? What have we done lately to, to rock him, to rock his world with our unbelief? Some questions aren't rhetorical. Y'all can say anything. You can. <coughs> but you don't have to say it out loud to hear it registering. No, so I'll admit it that part of my prayer on a real regular basis is we just don't get it, do we? And I imagine the Almighty with the frown going, I don't know why. It can't be that hard. We just don't get it sometimes. Mm. Yeah, we just don't get it sometimes. And, and as Jesus is there wondering at, at our unbelief, I want to call our attention to the verse that um, is so easy to skate over in verse, verse 1 of this chapter 6. <coughs> It says there that Jesus came to his hometown, and then what? What? How does that sentence end? End. And his disciples followed him. <coughs> Jesus came to this field of defeat, followed by people who were convinced that he was walking the right direction, that his teachings and his practices and his ways are the ways that lead to growth and and life and fulfillment and 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 beauty. And so in the, in the wake of this momentary setback, verse 6 comes, and, and we can stop reading because the, my Bible separates the, the first part of verse 6 from the second part of verse 6 because what happens after he is amazed at their unbelief? He dusts his hometown dust off of his feet, and verse 6 tells us he went out among their villages teaching. Jesus does not call down lightning to zap the people who are against him. He doesn't even dust off his, his, his rifle and, and make a plan to overcome his adversaries. He, he, he doesn't start uh, rumors or a petition drive or he doesn't, he doesn't run for public office. He continues to do what he's been called to do. He teaches and he calls and he sins and he suffers 